Hey everybody, this is Frankie Slauson, and welcome to the Frankie Slauson Show. And today on Frankie's Icons of Pop Culture series, we are talking today with uh, a guy who definitely has uh, done a lot of different iconic roles in his uh, career, whether it be uh, on National Lampoon or in uh, many uh, movies such as Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters 2, and even a favorite of mine, uh, Kindergarten Cop. I bring to you Mr. Michael Gross. How's it going? Good morning. Yeah, how, how are you doing? How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good, thank you. I live on the beach in a little bungalow in Oceanside, California. <clears throat> and um, me and the cat, and life is good. Oh, cool. Cool, cool. Yeah, I've never never been to California before, but the closest I've ever been was to uh, Astoria, Oregon. Ah, Astoria. <laughs> <laughs> Kindergarten cop. Yes. <laughs> and uh, it, um, it was a very weird town in Astoria. I, now, you got to remember, it's been a long time since I've been there, but yeah. one of the things that was strangest about it is at the time it was kind of really run down. And uh, I remember we scouted it, we location scouted it with Ivan Reitman, the director. And we had the whole crew, the art director, the location manager, me, you know, lots of people. Sure. We're walking the streets, and Ivan said, <coughs> "Ivan said, where are we going to get normal-looking people as extras?" <laughs> <laughs> it, it had a sense of uh, everyone looked like they were out of the, some zombie movie. It was like a very truly it was kind of weird. And we actually had to bring extras up from Portland uh, who looked like normal people. <laughs> I suppose, I yeah. To, I swear to God, that's true. Yeah, and, and uh, when I went down there, I've actually been down there twice. I went down there in 2008 for a vacation in 2012, and both times I went and saw the famous uh, Goonie House and uh, the uh, school where the uh, kindergarten cop uh, was filmed, or at least the outer area, anyway, of the school. Yeah, I know. it was a great school. We, we, we scouted up and down the entire West Coast try to find some place that fit the story. And here's what's strange about it is, if you remember the storyline of Kindergarten Cop, yep. uh, the mother was hiding hiding from uh, basically her ex-husband. Uh-huh. And we went to the school, and I was taking pictures, you know, basically taking photos for the art department, and, you know, because we had to build a set in Los Angeles, you know. And... Um, the, they were kind of nervous, and I said, "Why?" They said, "Well, a lot of women here right. are hiding from their husbands." Oh boy! Uh, ironically, the town actually fit the storyline. Oh, okay. And then we built the interior of the school here in Los Angeles as a set. Yeah, because uh, a lot of people don't realize that the. Uh it was only just the outer area that was used in the uh, of the school. It wasn't actually the, or, or did you guys actually use any part of the inside of the school to use in the movie? You no, know, we 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 didn't shoot interiors at all. I don't think. Okay. Uh, we just used the exteriors. Okay. Yeah, I guess that's what a lot of people have to realize. See, even even when I first. Uh, See, I'm only 29 years old, so when I first watched the uh, Kindergarten Cop way back, you know, when I was a little kid, I thought, oh, geez, that's kind of neat. They, they record inside and outside of the school, and then I, when, I, when I finally realized, you know, how it was made and everything, it's kind of a little disappointing at first because, you know, that's why a lot of people uh, visit Astoria because they think that, uh, you know, the school, the whole entire school was used. I know you guys use the, uh, the back part, the, uh, the uh, uh, play, playground. I believe. Yeah, yeah, we did the playground. We used it. And, you know, they have those wide scenes where everybody's running outside. And yeah. I directed the second unit on that as well. So we did a big establishing shots. And, and we, you know, we, we did film in a restaurant in Astoria. And then we used Cannon Beach. Okay. You know, kind of beautiful, uh, spectacular uh, Pacific Ocean view, you know. Oh, sure. Yeah, the, I, I personally think the, the, the whole town of Astoria was uh, pretty cool overall. Whether you're a kindergarten cop fan or a Goonies fan or a Ninja Turtles fan, or well, I, you know, I almost died making that movie. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, I was directing second unit in a helicopter. Oh, wow! It, it was me and the helicopter pilot, and then the cameraman in the back. 
and it's, a, it's, an, it's an establishing shot that's in the movie. You see the car coming across the highway, and then the helicopter lifts up and goes over the bridge to Astoria mm -hmm. and reveals Astoria. So in other words, that's the establishing shot of okay. Astoria. Okay. So we get an helicopter, and we're, we're doing a test run, and the car drives along, and the helicopter lifts up over the, over the bridge. It's kind of a nice end-of-the-day uh, beauty shot. And we said, okay, this is good. Let's go do it. So we go back, and we go back to one. I don't know if you know that. It's a movie term, back to one. <laughs> okay. Back to one means put everybody in the first position again. Oh, sure. You know? Start all over so again. Back, back, back to one, and the car goes back. And So I'm flying along, and we lift up, and the wind had changed. So we're about three or 400 feet above the bridge, <laughs> and the helicopter lost lift. It started shaking, and suddenly it couldn't fly anymore. And it dove down. It tilted down, and we're heading toward the river. I'm looking out. The, I'm looking out the front window of the helicopter, and we are going down oh, to the river. And the helicopter pilot, he's got the stick in his hand, and he says, "Oh shit!" <laughs> and, I, and I said to myself, "Those are always the last words on a black box, aren't they?" Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. That's the last thing you hear before the plane crashes. And I went. <laughs> And I actually saw the river coming up at me faster, 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 faster. We're diving. And it's not often you actually get to reflect on what you think are the last seconds of your life. Yeah. And I closed my eyes and I said, this is it. Oh, geez. And he pulled it out about 70 feet above the water. Oh, geez. Pulled it out. Pulled it out and we landed. I got out and I pissed for about 20 minutes it seems <laughs> my knees were shaking yeah and we got back we got back in the helicopter and went up and got the shot wow well yeah. that's I'm, 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 well, he says, I understand the difference now you, you understand that the wind had changed yeah but I didn't realize the helicopters could lose lift if the wind isn't right and how and, uh, how high were you guys up in the air what had happened at, at our height we were at three or four hundred feet okay and, and then we went straight down wow straight down pulled it out in the last second. And we had, our production office was right under the bridge. So they came out to watch us shoot, right? Because they knew we were shooting. Yep. And one of the people in the production office said to me, what were you doing flying under the bridge? I said, we weren't flying under the bridge, we were falling. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I can only imagine. Uh, yeah, it's one of the four times in my life that I survived death. Yeah, man. So, how, how was it working with uh, Arnold in the movie? Arnold's a joy. He's a professional's professional. Yep. He works really hard. He's dedicated. He does the job. He uh, supports uh, promotion afterward. Um, and he was. And you got to remember, this is our second film with him because we did Twins before that. Yep. I remember. So. Um, it was a joy working with him. I, I had nothing bad to say about Arnold. He's, uh, regardless of what you might think of his political career, he was a, a fabulous guy to work with on film. Yeah, I, I, it, I enjoyed his uh, recent film, uh, The Last Stand, that just came out. Uh, I watched it in theaters, and I, I, I watched it again on Blu-ray when it came out, and uh, very, very good movie. I think he still got it, you know? Yeah, I know. Was, well, you know, he, his thing was, he and Ivan became social friends at some point. Ivan Reitman. Yep. Uh, who directed both Twins and Kindergarten Cop and who I worked for for 15 years. Um, he said to Ivan one day, he said, when we, with the time we did Twins, he said, you know, I'd love to do a comedy. He hadn't done comedy. And Ivan knew he had a good variety sense of humor. And he said, well, I'll, I'll think of something. And it turns out that Ivan was also talking to Danny DeVito at the time, along on a friendship basis. <laughs> and he went to Danny and he said, well, how would you like to make a movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger? And Danny thought, well, that'd be cool. You know, what do you got in mind? He said, I don't know. I don't know. And he went back and he said in the shower, in the shower, he got the idea, wait a minute, what if they were twin brothers? <laughs> <laughs> 
and it was the easiest sell ever made to a, to a movie studio. <laughs> he walks into the Universal, he goes, I have an idea. It's Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito and their twin brothers. They said, fine, when do you want to make it? <laughs> That's it. One cent sell, no pitch, nothing. That's it. Wow. They said, That's perfect. And then we had to find writers who then had to come up and make a script. Because we didn't have, we didn't have, we had no idea how to make a story out of that. Yeah. We just thought, what a cool idea. And that's how Twins got made. And you know, you know, it's kind of funny, funny too, you know, just the fact that, you know, pretty much all the movies that you worked on or had a part in, uh, besides maybe a few, uh, are my personal favorites. I mean, I, I grew up on Ghostbusters 1 and 2. I grew up on, uh, I think Twins was like one of, one of the first movies I actually see, seen uh, on VHS. Uh, it used to run on HBO all the time. And yeah, then I fell in love with Tim Garrett. My first movie was Heavy Metal. Yep. I, I don't think I've ever seen Heavy Metal, uh, though. I mean, I've listened to Heavy Metal, but I've never heavy seen Heavy Metal? No, I haven't. I have not. You, you fool, you. <laughs> well, I didn't know, you know, at the time, I you know, I didn't really know what I was about or, like, what, uh, you know, I heard, uh, did, didn't uh, John Candy have uh, a role in that movie? Yes, he did. Okay. In fact, John Candy was supposed to do the Rick Moranis role in Ghostbusters, and he turned it down. Yeah, I, I, I remember, uh, because... Yeah, uh, he, was our, he was our first choice. And, and, of course, John knew Ivan really well because John's in Stripes. Yep. And Ivan had directed him in Stripes. And he's a wonderful guy, by the way. Candy's a great guy. Oh, he's a great guy. Oh, yeah, one of my and, all-time favorites. Yeah, he's a wonderful guy. Why he turned it down, I'm not sure. I, I never knew the, the backstory of that, but he turned it down, and we gave it to Rick Martins. And, and, you know, that's kind of funny, because uh, I remember the, the Ghostbusters music video had John Candy and Chevy Chase and a bunch of people that were not in the, mo in the movie at all. In that's the video. Right. So that's kind of that's kind of neat, and, uh, and I I believe that uh, wasn't uh, John Belushi supposed to be uh, Peter Venkman and all that stuff, and Eddie, Eddie Murphy supposed to be Winston, and, or was those just rumors? Well, no, Belushi was never considered. Um, first of all, I, I forgot when John died. Um, uh, yeah, 1982. <laughs> so I suppose. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, Ghostbusters came out before, so. Yeah, no, he was never. He was actually never considered for Ghostbusters. Um, yeah, well, the, actually, Arsenio Hall uh, almost got the role in Ghostbusters. Okay. Um, but our feeling was at the time that if you put a really strong actor in there, uh, a person who was really known for their personality, it would have overloaded the cast. Yeah. In other words, there's so much character in uh, Danny Aykroyd, Bill Murray, and Harold Ramis, we wanted the fourth role to be something that was a little more grounded, a little more every man, you know, a little more average guy. Okay. Not so much another major character. <laughs> it, it, it would have somehow thrown the balance of the cast off. So Ernie Hudson played a role because he, he kind of downplays it in a nice way, you know. Yeah, yeah, it seems like, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, kind of forget that he was even in, that, in both those movies because, uh, you know, everybody else is recognized from a lot of different things that they did with Saturday Night Live and SCTV and everything, and uh, here's Ernie Hudson come along. <laughs> well, we knew, you know, we knew Ernie Hudson because Ivan produced a movie once, he didn't direct it, he produced it, called Space Hunter Adventures in the Forbidden Zone. Okay. That almost nobody has seen, Molly Ringwald's in it. <laughs> Okay. Um, it was in 3D and unwatchable in 3D but it's okay in 2D it's nice yeah, movie, sure. actually. Yeah. but Ernie Hudson's in it and that's when we met Ernie Hudson so we knew him we knew him already you know. I don't, I'm sure he was a, a nice guy to work with I mean he seems like uh, even, even even now you know he, he uh, tries to promote Ghostbusters anytime he can no Ernie is a sweetheart that's the only way I can put it. <laughs> he's a wonderful man. He's a wonderful father. Um, I saw him uh, about two years ago at some uh, Ghostbusters thing. He uh, he gets paid to do promotion, and uh, he's he's the only one who's going to at this point run around. Well, Danny Aykroyd loves to promote Ghostbusters too, but sure. um, 
uh, Ernie kind of shows up at everything, if you get my drift. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, he, he, he continues to work, and he's a fine actor. Yeah, he's he's done a lot of different uh, a lot of different roles and everything, you know, for yeah. a guy who's uh, you know who just trying to you know just entertain people, whether it's a, a comedy or, or more serious roles. I mean, he seems to know what he's doing anyway. Yeah, it, it's a shame he's never gotten a bigger role uh, for himself in recent films. But he's a comfortable actor. You know, there's, there's, there's certain kinds of actors who just they're just happy to be working. Yeah, and they're actors. And they're actors. You know, and, and he works all the time. Not many big roles, but um, he gets along. He's fine. And like I said, he's a fine, fine, fine man. Really lovely man. And, and uh, you know, with, with uh, the difference between Ghostbusters 1 and, and, and uh, Ghostbusters 2, my personal favorite uh, out of the both of them are, is Part 2, only because I, I, I just, uh, I, uh, I like the, the fact that uh, there's a bad guy in the painting, you know, uh, and he's like the bad guy. He's like the guy who's going to end the world and everything like that. Vigo, and uh, you know, I think that whole thing is kind of a uh, kind of cool. How whoever came up with that idea or concept to do uh, a bad guy in a painting, you know, to see that in movies today, let alone yesterday, you know. So yeah, it's also it's all directed by um, Bo Welch. Okay, um, he he's the one that created it. He's the art director, and uh, he did a magnificent job. His best work's probably like Man, Men in Black. Okay. Um, a lot of other things as well. Wow. Great guy. Great guy. Um, married to uh, Catherine... Crap, I don't remember the whole name. <laughs> she, uh, S S C S S C T V. Uh, oh, uh, Catherine. Uh, yeah. Was she the one that was in uh, Home Alone? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Exactly. Sorry. Can't yeah, that's that. okay. <laughs> and, they're, and they're married, and what a lovely, smart man he is, too. He did a beautiful art direction job on that thing. And in the painting, I did the painting, and um, we had to do it. There's a thing in, in California, Laguna Beach, where they do these living paintings. It's kind of a weird stage act thing. Yeah. See, where everyone looks like they're in a painting, and then they move. So they're doing impression. They're on stage, looking like a painter. They don't move, and then suddenly they move. It, it's a very strange thing. You have to see it to understand it. And so we went to them and we said, "Help us, this guy." Because we didn't have CGI then. We had yeah. no computer graphics, you know. And said, so "Make this guy. How do we make this guy look like he's in a painting when he's standing there and then can move?" So we had to like paint the guy and paint the background, and so I did a lot of that. I did it with my own. Actually, I even took a brush to it and painted some of it. Wow! No, that's pretty. That's pretty cool because you know I I kind of wondered how that whole idea or concept even started. I mean, when you guys were looking for uh, for bad guys, other options than you guys have. I mean, for other other bad guys. Well, that, that's kind of funny you mention that because. We hired a guy who was a, an ex wrestler uh, from uh, Poland or someplace, or some, someplace in Eastern Europe. And what an asshole he was. I mean, he was just a horrible, terrible human being. He was, the guy was just disgusting. You know, he used to, uh, he, used to he had an assistant, um, a young white girl, uh, and he used to call her his nigger. Oh, jeez. He said, Where's my nigger? You know, it's like, the guy was horrible. Nobody really wanted to be in a room with the guy. I'm the only guy I could work with him. And he was pissed because we replaced his voice. We never intended to use his voice. You know, we put yeah. a, a voice over, you know. Yeah, Max, Max uh, yeah. Von Cook or something that side. Yeah, yeah. 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 But boy, what a disgusting man. <laughs> he was dead. He died a uh, few years ago. Jeez. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, it's kind of funny how that kind of works, you know, because... Uh, I believe, uh, I think his name was uh, Norbert Group or, or Wilhelm von Hamburg, who you had. Uh, yeah. And yeah, he was also... You can look him up on Google. You can Google him and it's, yeah. you see that he, he's a pretty disgusting story on Google. <laughs> but I, I'm sure he was fun to work with, though. I mean, you know, overall, a, a true professional. No, he was an asshole. <laughs> also, he, also, he was the ex-wrestler that you hired. The yeah. guy that you used. 
Okay, okay. See, I didn't know. I, I thought you actually uh, used a different, uh, another wrestler besides that. Because uh, uh, Germany, I believe. Yeah, it's some of there, yeah. yeah. Eastern Europe. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I guess you never know. I mean, you know, I, you know, maybe you're you're lucky to work with some good people, and sometimes a, well, an asshole comes along. <laughs> yeah, well, he, he he actually is one of. I'm, I'm privileged to say that my entire career, like eleven films for Ivan, um, I don't think I worked with more than two or three assholes. Okay. I mean, it, everyone's been wonderful, and and the cast of Busters, Twins, Kimber and Cop, all of them, everybody loved everybody. It was a wonderful experience because everyone got along so well. We laughed all the time. It was, uh, it was they were terrific movies to make. So, what do you think it would have been like if uh, if Ivan would have ra- waited till like now to make Ghostbusters or, or Ghostbusters Two or, or even Kindergarten Cop? Or what do you think the process would have been like? I'm not sure. You know, Ivan produced. Now. He doesn't direct anymore. Okay, and he's. In fact, did you see Hitchcock? He directed, he produced Hitchcock. Yeah, I heard, I heard something about that, yeah. Yeah. And his son, of course, is Jason Reitman, yep. who's, you know, a famed young director now, which is wonderful. In fact, my son is a helicopter cameraman, and I got him into the uh, camera guild and Ghostbusters 2 at 19 years old. And he's a, a noted, uh, well known uh, helicopter cinematographer. And if you ever seen Up in the Air, the uh, movie that Jason Reitman directed, okay, with George Clooney, with George Clooney. I don't think I have, but that's what I should yeah. I should look at. All right, but if you look at all the aerials that are on the establishing credits and used as segue from city to city, I mean, my son shot all those. Oh wow! So my son, my son got to work with Jason Reitman, which is kind of really sweet, you know. In fact, we were shooting. We were shooting which movie now? I think it was movie. We were doing Beethoven second, Beethoven two, yeah. and um, Catherine Reitman, who is Ivan's daughter, is in the movie. She has a couple of lines, a couple of scenes, and I remember sitting up there, and my son was an assistant cameraman on it, and and Catherine uh, and Katrine, uh, Ivan's wife. Are, are sitting there watching the scene with her daughter and my son and she said look our kids are making a movie <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know that's kind of that's kind of cool too because I, I believe it or not uh, back in 2006 when I first started doing interviews and all that I actually had the chance to uh, to talk to Jason Reitman for just a little bit and uh, that's around the time when he was doing uh, Thank You for Smoking and uh, Juno he was just uh, about oh, yeah, ready to yeah. shoot that. So that. Yeah, yeah. Well, Sorry, I cut you off. Oh, oh that's okay. I uh, I uh, said that I had the chance to interview uh, Jason Reitman back in like 2006. But uh, thank you for smoking and uh, Juno. When he announced uh, he was going to film Juno at that time, long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> I never never had the chance to talk to I- Ivan. I would like to. I don't know how. One gets a hold of him. I don't know if you're able to get a hold of him or if you're friends with him. You know, or <laughs> I've not spoken. I've not spoken to Ivan in fifteen years. Jeez, not even yeah. on fa- not even on Facebook or anything. Huh? No, no, nothing <laughs> at all. And Jason, the last time I saw Jason was probably his bar mitzvah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Uh, I gave him my comic collection. <clears throat> I, I remember. I remember thinking to myself, the room was full of people who, you know, I don't know if you know about how our mitzvahs work, but you leave an envelope, which is a gift, you know. Yeah. And so all these people, a number of famous people, are all leaving these envelopes, and I'm thinking how much money there might be in them, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And I said, like, what am I, I going to give them, you know? And so I gave them my first edition of Mad Magazine as a comic, the first edition of Mad as a magazine, and some other EC comic thing, and I gave them to him, and uh, to this day, I, 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 I bet he still has them. Oh, I'm sure. But, uh, we've, but we've not spoken. No, I, I'm, I'm, I've taken an entirely different route in my life. I don't do movies anymore. Um, I live on the beach. I'm a photographer, a painter. I curate at, at the Oceanside Museum of Art, and uh, I live a kind of simple, quiet life. Yeah, uh, well, that's, no, that's no show business anymore. 
<laughs> well, that's okay. I mean, uh, you know, I just think it's because of the fact that you've had a pretty cool career. You got to do work with a lot of different people. You got to do a lot of movies, and uh, you got a lot to your credit. I mean, that's why that's uh, why I wanted to do this interview with you because uh, you are definitely somebody that's an icon or, or done some iconic things uh, with pop culture, and you you definitely fit the bill. So, so I'm happy yeah. that you're doing stuff. I, I had I had something very nice happen to me last year. Um, I went to Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. Uh, I was 17. I went to art school. And last year was the 125th anniversary of Pratt Institute as a university. Yeah. And they put up on their website about two or three hundred, two hundred icons that were created by Pratt alumni or star staff. And the number one voted most popular icon on that site was the Ghostbusters logo. Oh, yeah. So I, so I had the pleasure of 50 years after I walked into that school of having the most popular icon in the history of that school. Jeez. I thought, it's so nice to see that come full circle. You know what I mean? Yeah, I guess so. I thought, I thought when I was 17 years old, walking into that university, that one, as a kid, that one day I would be noted for having created the most famous icon in the history of the school. <laughs> I would have fallen over dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's that's definitely something you can be proud of, too, because you know, nobody else uh, ever created that idea. You're, you're, you're the one who got to do it. And then... Uh, I, I love that logo and I love the one for part two as well and I think it, it definitely uh, it definitely fits for uh, for any Ghostbuster fan uh, even to this day and, and I know for a fact that there's a lot of people that still you know dress up as uh, Ghostbusters for Comic Con events and everything and, and uh, well these, these people these people actually spend thousands of dollars to make those backpacks they show up and they're in every state in the union not to mention overseas one of them sent me a wonderful book he made a book for me oh. of variations on the Ghostbusters logo that's, that are made around the world and um, in every state and like I said in, in overseas and they're, they're fanatical fans and it's a wonderful thing to see I mean who would have thunk it I did think I knew that once Ghostbusters was a hit, you know, look, we knew it was good. We knew it was really good. We knew it was going to be a hit. But we didn't know it was going to be iconic. We didn't know that it was, nobody could know that. You know? <laughs> and I remember the time as it was growing and growing. I said to somebody, you know, 20 years from now, this is going to be a generation's Wizard of Oz. <laughs> this is yeah. a movie that's going to affect so many people since they, they were kids. And sure enough, it's 30 years later, and it's huge. It's huge. And, you know, we had no way of predicting that or, or, or suggesting it would happen, but it did. And it's amazing. And I watched the movie again recently. I watched Ghostbusters. You know, when you make a movie, you don't really... It's, it's really hard to judge a movie when you make it because you yeah. do it so, you know, intently. Um, I watched it the other day, and I said, what a fine movie. I mean, really... If you have to list a hundred comedies in history, it makes the it makes the it, it, it's included in the list. And you think, wow, how fortunate am I to have been able to touch that, and be part of it? Um, I'm a very, very, very fortunate man. So, were you uh, were you pretty surprised when Ivan wanted to do a, a sequel? Uh, <laughs> ask me that again. Uh, were you pretty surprised when uh, Ivan wanted to do a sequel? Well, it was a very strange situation. If you notice, they're five years apart. And when we did the first one, we all walked away from it and didn't think about it again. And then we did a cartoon show. Yep. And we did a cartoon show because we didn't think that there would be a sequel. We didn't. Then we said, they fine, you know, and did 114 cartoon shows, um, which uh, many of them are very, 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 very good. Many are very, very bad. And he didn't have that much money, but they, they were well written, you know. And Joe Shinsky, um was the uh, main editor on them, and he was a, a fabulous writer. He created also uh, Babylon Five, 
did a lot of other things. Um, and um, so we didn't know what was what the franchise was about. And somehow, after the cartoon show, somehow we just got to say, Let, let's make a sequel. <laughs> and it was as simple as that. And it had to happen, remember, that in order for there to be a sequel, or it needed the agreement of what we call all the boys. The boys. Sure. The boys are Danny Aykroyd, Bill Murray, Howard Ramis, and Ivan Reitman all had to agree to do this movie. And then, and that was tough. It was tough to put a schedule together even. And then we raced into it and we did number two. <coughs> number two, I like number two a lot, but it's flawed. And it's, one of the reasons it's flawed is at that point, there were no surprises. And the audience had not only seen the first movie, but they'd seen a cartoon show for five years. So seeing the Ghostbusters was not an original thing to them. You know, there was, they had expectations. Oh, sure. So we had to fill, those, fill that in, if you will. And, um, and in the end, we never had an ending to that movie. We never had a script that completely worked. We knew it. Um, we were desperate for an ending. We had no ending. And the idea of the Statue of Liberty walking up is not spectacular anymore because you can see the state of Marshmallow Man, yeah. which is better. Yeah, I guess um, that'd be more iconic, I guess. Yeah. So it was kind of a weak, a weak attempt. Um, it has wonderful moments, though. It has, has great moments. My, my favorite moments in that movie, actually, are the moments with uh, Rick Moranis and, uh, and and his relationship to, uh, what's her name, sorry, Annie Potts. Oh, yeah, 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 uh, Annie Potts, yes. Yeah. yeah, I love that part of it. By the way, is she a sweetheart? Oh, <coughs> what a sweetheart. <laughs> Oh, you could fall in love with her in a minute. She oh, was, I'm sure. What even, a lovely, even, what to a lovely day, sure. even to this day, I'm sure. Even to this day, I'm sure. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 pretty cool. Just the fact that you got to do so many different things, and and uh, I, I kind of wonder why there was never a Blu-ray release. I believe there is. Isn't it? I, I mean, I, uh, I, of uh, part two, that is not part one. Just part um, two. It's not a, not a Blu-ray too. I, I didn't nope. even know that. Nope, just a I Blu-ray have, one. I have a, I have a, I have a, I have a set of discs that are not Blu-ray. By the way, Blu-ray. You should know this. By the way, I recently went to uh, a theater in uh, Sonoma County where they projected a Blu-ray of Heavy Metal. Oh wow! And then I then I did then I got up and I did Q and A. You know, um, the projection in the theater of a nice size screen, a Blu-ray was better than the answer print that we projected in 1981 of, Ghost, of uh, Heavy Metal. It was better. It was sharper, clearer, brighter, and the sound was way better. So for your, for your information, these Blu-ray releases are better than the original prints. Oh yeah, the the quality looks a lot better, and I was you know I'm pretty blown away with the the Ghostbusters release. But the, the thing is, I, I just hope that eventually you know they'll make a, a Blu-ray release of uh, part two as well. Because even though there may have been some flaws and stuff, it's still an, also an iconic movie. I know the first one will always be better than the second one, but you know it's like what they did with Back to the Future. They they put all three of them on a Blu-ray and they put them in a box set, and there you go. You know. Yeah, well, I hope so, too, because I get royalties from that. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, I mean, uh, it's been uh, fun uh, chatting with you. I mean, it just, this is uh, definitely uh, an interview that I'll definitely remember, even though being uh, having a cold, you know, kind of sucks. You know, I wish I had my normal voice so I could actually so you could actually hear what I really sound like. But, uh, but no, I, I definitely uh, got to say uh, thanks for just uh, being a part of the film industry and, and being a... Uh, uh, into, I think your your work is uh, very amazing. Uh, I think that uh, it's cool that you can uh, to love what you do and be a success out of it because, uh, you know, nowadays, you know, I'm sure it's a lot harder to get into the film industry today than it was, you know, when you did it. Well, I, first of all, I, you know, I have, I have two lives. Um, before, long before I did any movies, I was the art director of National Lampoon. Oh, that's right, yeah. Yeah, and that's how I got to know Ivan. 
Um, and a lot of the work I did there was in comics. I had that great cover of the gun to the dog's head. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, that's mine. And it's rated one of the best magazine covers in the history of publishing, uh, top 40 list or something by some some organization. I don't know what. Um, very fortunate, but he's a fortunate guy, you know. And, and when I got to make movies, it was like... Just for your information, when I was in high school in Newburgh, New York, and I was 16 years old, um, I made movies. I made the 60 millimeter movies. We published a fanzine. Are you familiar with the magazine Cinefax? Oh, uh, maybe. Is that is that like a movie magazine? Okay. It's, a, it's a special effects magazine. Okay, right? okay, sure. Yeah, well, Don Shea, who publishes that, and I went to high school together in Newburgh, New York. Oh, wow. And, and he now lives in Riverside, and we're very dear friends. Um, so, there's actually, he actually did an issue of Cinefix that was about Ghostbusters. And so here we are, these two guys who went to high school together, how many years later, he's <coughs> publishing a magazine, and I'm making a movie, and <laughs> my movie is a cover of his magazine. Oh, wow. And he has a photograph of Arthur Clark, Arthur C. Clark, reading reading that copy of Cinefix. Oh, jeez. And uh, that really weirds me out. It's like, let me see, Arthur C. Clark is reading Cinefix published by my friend about my movie. And... Nothing makes life more complete than something like that. Yeah, <laughs> it's no like, kidding. I'm a very, 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 very blessed man. I'd say so. Did you ever? Uh, did you ever get the chance to play that uh, Ghostbusters video game at all? You know, I don't play video games. <laughs> Not even just uh, to check it out or anything. No, I don't even have the equipment. Oh, okay. Whatever it's, whatever it's Sony, whatever. I don't even know what. Sony yeah, is. well, it's on, on PS3 and Xbox 360. Uh, yeah. Well, I just I just figure I'd ask that because you know since uh, since you had a big role in, in both movies that you'd be interested in seeing what they you know even if you look it up on YouTube there's like a whole tutorial you don't even have to play the game you can just watch you know like someone will do like a walkthrough you know. Uh, uh -huh. did, were you kind of surprised that they wanted to make a, a video game? I never went there, and I had nothing to do with it. And, uh, and ironically, even Sony today basically doesn't speak to me. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's like, and worse than that, it's Mattel. I approved all the toy line that came out of the Ghostbusters animated show, the, oh. the TV show. I was involved in creating a lot of the toys. And I go to Comic Con now, and, and, and I show up, and I look at the big Ghostbusters Mattel thing, and I go up to them and I say, "I'm Michael Gross, and I did this logo, and I would produce this movie." And they look at me like I'm a stranger. Oh wow! I, like, I said, "Do you want to? Can I talk to somebody about maybe getting some toys?" And they go, "Well, we'll get back to you." And that's it. So I, I'm non persona now. <laughs> <laughs> so so. Uh so are you talking like the the toys that uh, recently were released uh, from Comic Con not too long ago? Like I, yeah, yeah. Because I actually yeah. have the I have the first three anyway. I have I'm just uh, of Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, and Harold Ramis as their characters. Uh, I have them up in my in my room or whatever, where I have a collection of little iconic toys and everything. Uh, I thought that they were kind of neat. I I don't understand why they they had to be so expensive, but uh, but I thought they're pretty neat anyway. Yeah, no, they, um, no, but it, as far as they're concerned, I don't exist. I had a great relationship with Mattel 30 years ago, or whatever, 25 years ago. Yeah. And today, they don't even know who I am. Yeah, that's kind of sad. Wow. Yeah. That's the way I like it. You know, they're all kids. You know, I'm, I'm almost 70. Oh, jeez. These people are all in their 20s. Yeah. 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 How old are you? I'm, I'm, I'm 29. Yeah, <clears throat> but but even though I'm a young guy, I, I, I actually I did a um, <clears throat> I did a lecture um, at Berkeley, and uh, it was I, I call it 
National Lampoon, the Ghostbusters, taking risks. <laughs> yeah. And I talk about all the risks I've taken. I've leaped off a lot of cliffs. Just saying, you know, let's just try to do this. And a great risk. And going to the movies with moving to California, selling houses, and doing lots of things with a great wife who supported me all, all along the line. And I'm giving this lecture, and I'm showing this work from National Lampoon, and I'm showing this work from Ghostbusters, and it occurred to me that everyone in the room, everyone, wasn't born yet when any of these things were done. <laughs> even, even Ghostbusters. Wow. They were teenagers. Yeah. That was 30 years ago. So I was like, I'm, I went, oh shit, I'm, <clears throat> I had to like, actually teach, I'm, I'm, I'm history, is what I am. I'm, I'm not, it's very odd for them. I'm like this old guy who did stuff before they were born. What a strange realization that was for me. Uh, and, and you know, even though I'm a young guy, I, I still have a lot of respect for you know the the past and stuff. I mean, I was you know probably one years old when the first Ghostbusters came out. But I, the way I grew up as a kid, you know, I always had I always loved. You know the classics and stuff, and I, I still think you know a lot of the movies from the past are a lot better than some of the stuff from today. And you know, I mean, it, you know, just that a lot of times uh, in today's world, teenagers and, and young kids, they they just like all the new stuff. You, it's very rare you find a, a kid who actually you know knows about Star Wars and, and look, you know like Batman and and knows about all types of things from the past, uh, knowing a lot, or liking a lot of stuff from today. You know, so. <laughs> Kind of yeah, well, to me, it just means I'm getting old. <laughs> I well, said I'm 67, so wow. I was, I was, how old was I? Did Ghostbusters? I was, um, well, that 38 was, or something. Okay, sure, sure. Some, something like that. So you ever, so you ever look back at those pictures and just say, "Wow, what you know, what happened?" Uh, or like. Uh, uh, if I could go back to do it again, I would do it in a heartbeat. Um, it was when I look back on it. I look back on it the same way you might look back on your childhood. It's a magic time. It was a magic, magic time. I got to make movies, and every day that I got out of bed, I put my feet on the floor and said, "I'm making movies. This is so cool. This is so cool." Because I just couldn't believe I'd ever be in a position to actually be making movies, and I made eleven films. Yeah, well, that's that's pretty cool, and, and I and I definitely will check out uh, Heavy Metal. What what is kind of the the story to uh, the the Heavy Metal? Because I, I definitely am interested. Oh dear, it's it, it's it's too long a story. Oh, right, well, I mean, can you kind of sum it up a little bit? Like, uh, well, uh, well. <laughs> Boy, well, well, well. <laughs> there was, we had a publishing office in New York. They published National Lampoon and Heavy Metal as a magazine, two magazines. The publisher, there were two, there were two men there, uh, Maddie Simmons and Len Mogul. Maddie Simmons took Heavy Metal, took National Lampoon, and made Animal House. Ivan Reitman produced Animal House with him. So Len Mogul, who had the heavy metal, said, I want to make a movie too. So he thought, what if he took all this material from the magazine and made it into an adult animated film? And he couldn't get it sold anywhere. He tried. And eventually he called up Ivan Reitman and he said, are you interested in making this into a movie? And Ivan said, I can get that movie made with one phone call to Canada, because Ivan's Canadian, and Ivan had produced, among other things, Cronenberg's uh, first film. So Ivan had a reputation in Canada as a man who actually made movies that made money. And he said, fine. And I was in New York at the time, and, and I decided I was gonna move to California to try and make movies because I knew John Belushi. John Belushi's wife was my assistant in the art department at National Lampoon. Oh, cool. And I, and I knew John, and I knew Bill Murray. Bill Murray and I were friends. 
And they all were saying, come on out, Mike, the web is fine, you know, we'll make movies. I didn't have a job, I didn't have anything. This is what I talk about when I say taking risks. Sure. And I said to my wife, I said, um, what if we sell the house, we had a house in upstate New York. I said, what if we sell the house, and let's, let's move to California, and let's try to make movies. And she said, fine. I had no movies, I had nothing, I had nothing. I didn't have a job, I didn't have anything. While I was on the plane flying to California, Ivan Reitman decided to make heavy metal. Now, Len Mogul, who was the publisher at that time, already got me involved, and he said, you know, remember Michael Gross? And he goes, yeah, I remember Michael Gross. He says, well, I sort of said he'd be a associate producer if we ever did a heavy metal movie, because he seems to understand animation and art and blah, blah, blah. So Ivan says, well, you know, I can't guarantee anything when he gets here, why don't you have him call me? So I land in California. I get a phone call uh, from Len Mogul who says, go over there and see Ivan Reitman because he's going to make heavy metal and you got to sell yourself. Now, i never been to, Cal I've been to California once or twice, but I've never, I, I didn't live in California before and there I am. And I, 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 in fact, I went to go see Ivan and I got lost and I went to the Disney lot by mistake. Oh, jeez. Which is around the corner from the Universal. Sure. Um, so I went over to Universal and I go on the lot, and he has a producer's office. And I said, hello, I've been, I'm, I'm, he says, yeah, how do you doing, Michael, blah, blah, blah. He says, he, he says, what are you gonna do? I understand that somehow you wanna be connected to this film. I said, well, what I'm gonna do is, he said, you're gonna have a lot of problems with animation because this artwork in the magazine has to be translated to animation. And it's hard, because it, you have to simplify it, you have to break it down, you have to make it animatable. You know, and and you can have a lot of cartoon artists who won't understand the material. So somebody's got to art direct them. Somebody's got to keep them on on model, if you will. And he said, "Sounds good. Why don't you uh, be a social producer?" I said, "Okay." So I landed in California and produced my first movie in three weeks. Oh wow! Well, that's pretty. That's pretty cool. And then, we went and then I, I then I took over the movie. I basically ran the movie because he was doing stripes at the same time, and basically handed me the responsibility for delivering heavy metal. None of us had done animation before. We built a studio in Montreal. Uh, it was amazing. We did it in eight eight studios in three countries. Yes. It was, yeah, and we did it in <laughs> record time and for no money. It was like amazing. We just we were we were too stupid to know better. It's like you know, if you look back on it, you say that was ridiculously impossible. Why did you do that? And we did. We pulled it off. You know, but that was my first movie. Wow. And uh, it was an extraordinary experience. Um, it's and, it, and there were special effects in it. So after that movie, Ivan did Space Hunter, the movie I mentioned in three D. And I, my name's not on it, but I consulted on the effects and the 3D part of it. And what happened was I was part of the office. So by the time Ghostbusters came up, he's, we'd never done a special effects movie. So I even said, you handle all these special effects. You gotta, you gotta get it done. We had no studio, no effects studio was available. And we built one from scratch. And um, it was an amazing, it was an amazing bunch of experiences. It was basically uh, a bunch of, we were like a bunch of kids making movies that involved special effects, animation, whatever, and we'd never done any of those things before. And we just kind of pulled it off out of naive could It's kind of funny how, how life works that way sometimes when you just figure that uh, I'm just going to do something with art and whatever and be a magazine uh, art director and all of a sudden here I'm making movies and, and, and Wow, you know, I mean, that's that's pretty cool, and I think well, I'm, also, I'm also a great believer that the, 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 the two best things in life are to do something where you learn, you know, you actually have to learn something, and the other one is it's, a, it's good if you're a little bit over your head because you're terrified, and those two things together are what makes life worth living. 
Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, and, and I think back in those days too. I mean, not not a whole lot of crap came out of the eighties. I know a lot of people will say there there was a lot of crap out of the eighties, but I don't think there really were. I think back in those days, you know, when you try to make a movie, you actually had to work your butt off to make a movie. Uh, nowadays, with CGI and all that, they make it way too easy uh, for special effects people. Uh, but I think back then, uh, with props and everything, I think that was cool, you know? Because I saw... Yeah, I saw, it, it, it was great. I'm glad I was part of the last of the era where we actually made big Rucka monsters. Yeah. You know? You had an actual creature shop, we called it. You know, we had to build those terror dogs for, you know, Ghostbusters. Sure. And we had to actually make them work with puppeteers, and it was actually very exciting. <laughs> very, very, very exciting. Yeah, and it, plus, yeah, I had to work with Scorny Weaver. <laughs> <laughs> and she was uh, doing Alien too at the time, I suppose, when she was doing Ghostbusters. Well, you know, she, Alien was like the late 70s. Yeah, so it was a while. It was like four years later or three years later or something. Oh, sure. But um, she's such a joy. And, of course, we went on to make other movies with her. Uh, we made Dave. You know, Dave is not an effects movie at all. No, no. And what a joy that movie was to make. And uh, she is... She is just magic. She's she's such a pleasure to be in a room with. She's such a professional and such a talented woman. Um, I've been really, really, really privileged to have be even uh, been in the room with some of these people that are working with them. Well, yeah, it looks it sounds like you had a pretty good cast, and and you know, that's what makes it iconic when you got a good cast and, and you know that the. Everybody so you know their lines. You're not working with somebody who's brand new, who's never done a movie before, uh, and that's what may, I think that's what may help make uh, Ghostbusters one and two uh, great because they had people that were you know already doing all, all types of movies yeah. and stuff. So <laughs> yeah, but hey, you know I I definitely appreciate having you on. I don't want to keep you on too much longer, but uh, I I appreciate the fact of uh, you know that we got to talk and. Uh, uh, like I said, I mean, it's it's amazing that you got to to have the career that you did, and uh, you know, thanks for letting me uh, you know, chat with you for almost an hour. No problem. Why don't you ask me one last question? Sure. Uh, after everything that you've done, if you could uh, go back and make uh, like, if you look back at some of the movies that you've done, uh, like, or or the movies that uh, you didn't do. That were from the eighties. What movie would you, what what movie would you love to to uh, be part of that you never got a chance to, like back in the eighties? If, if there was a movie that you that was made, that uh, you uh, were not a part of, what movie would you love to work on? That's a tough question. <laughs> um, it was hard to there, even answer it. <laughs> yeah, there, there there are a number of Spielberg movies which I would love to be a part of. Yeah. Um, and, and probably that's it. You know, I don't. I don't know. I, I I worked in a particular niche for a while, and we filled that niche. And I'm proud to have been part of it. And you know, that was our world. You know, we only. I can think about things we turned down. You know, movies. And, and we also we, we tried to develop Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy for almost five years. Oh wow! And we couldn't make it work as a script. And then, in fact, when it was finally made, it's still not much of a movie. It's it's, it's not really a movie. It's a problem. Yeah. Um, I, and my heart was in that for a long time. I had the opportunity to direct a sequel to Heavy Metal if we did it, but we decided not to. Um, I, I regret that I wasn't able to direct something. I wanted to direct um, Beethoven 2. Oh, the sure. second Beethoven movie. And... Uh, Ivan didn't feel that comfortable with me being able to direct, so I didn't. Um, I regret that. I would love to have had one film, any film, that actually had directed by me. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> but it never, but it never, it never happened. And yeah. It's not going to happen. So that's my only regret. But other than that, I'm so proud and happy to have been part of major, major, wonderful films. It, it, they're all Ivan Reitman films, you know, but I know my part in them, and I know what I did, and, and I know what my role was, and some of them I have to do with what they are on the screen, and some of them it was just a day job. But um, in any case, I'm just a fortunate guy. 
and I and I and I think I pretty much own besides maybe a couple that you've done. I think I pretty much own everything that you have worked on as far as Ghostbusters one and two, uh, Kindergarten Cup. I don't own Dave or Heavy Metal, but I own uh, both uh, Beethoven one and two, which I think are the best Beethovens because the ones that they did later on are kind of shitty, if you ask me. I don't yeah, know. <laughs> no, it became a franchise. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, just just more um, money maker, more or less. <laughs> you, know, you know that the first one was written by John Hughes. No, I I, I did not. Actually, I think I did know that. I think he yeah. even says that right in the credits. Yeah. He, he doesn't. No, he doesn't credit John Hughes. It's credited uh, Evan Dante. Oh. Um, he um, he had a deal with Universal to deliver some scripts, and basically, anyway, his name was taken off it because of a fight with Universal, but. Um, it's John Hughes script. It's a very tight script. Really nice. Beethoven one. It's actually a really nice script, and uh, it was really fun to work on. You know, except for working with stupid dogs. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, they were they were all a joy. They were all a joy. You know, they, you know, there's a couple of films you've not mentioned, and you're not likely to like Stop or My Mom Will Shoot. Oh, sure. Yeah, there's a film I regret having worked on. Um, <laughs> Big Shots is a nice little movie, but you can't find it anywhere. Um, they're, 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 I'm not sure of flops and, uh, and unknowns. And the worst experience of my life was Legal Eagles, where everybody hated everybody else. Oh, it was geez. just a horrible movie. Robert Redford lied to me every day. Deborah Winger was insecure. Ivan didn't get along with him. They didn't get along with him. They didn't get along with each other. It was a nightmare. Um, so sometimes they turn bad. Yeah, I, I guess uh, uh, looking at your website, I didn't know that you did. You helped with stop or my more shoot. I, I actually, I actually love that movie. Believe it or not. Oh, you don't get it. You know, frankly, I haven't seen it since it was made. <laughs> oh, I wonder how good it is. Maybe it's okay. I think I, they, I think they gave it a Blu-ray release. I believe. I, I think <laughs> to Mill Creek Productions. I think or or something like that. Uh, but yeah, but yeah, I I actually really I actually really did enjoy that one uh, with Sylvester uh, Sylvester Stallone and Estelle yeah. Getty. You know, that was pretty cool. Um, Stallone Stallone was uh, terrible, <laughs> terrible to work with. Um, but Estelle was great. Yeah, Estelle Getty. Yeah, she's a, just an old pro. She knows what she's doing. You know. Yeah, I suppose it was right around the time when. Uh, they were down doing uh, Gold Girls too, I suppose, or or maybe the last she season. Just finished Gold. I think she. I think they just finished Golden Girls. Yeah, and we were seeing Golden Girls. They make her look a lot older than she was. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yep. So she wasn't as old as that. You know? <laughs> but um, she did a good job, she, anyways. She did a good job uh, playing that part. <laughs> no, she did. She t she told me a funny story one day on the set, and she said. You know, she said, I had a producer call me up and ask me if I would do the role of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt in some of them. And she turned it down. And she says, you know why I turned it down? She says, why would I work for anyone stupid enough to think I should be Eleanor Roosevelt? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, she definitely, uh, I'm sure she was... Uh, not only fun to work with, but I'm sure she had a lot of, you know, witty humor and stuff because she kind of seemed like a, a type of person that, uh, you know, was almost like a, a red fox kind of just going to say what's ever on her mind. Doesn't matter if she offends anybody. Yeah. She can't take That's a joke. Like. Yeah. That's exactly what she's like. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know. Is she alive? No, she she passed away. Like, oh, she was like uh, uh, a couple, about two or three years ago. Uh, uh, mostly all the gold girls are dead, are, have died besides Betty White. Betty White's the only one still alive. Huh? <laughs> you didn't know that, huh? No, I mean, I just never bothered to look. Oh, I, I suppose you know. don't really keep up to date with the uh, entertainment he, uh, entertainment news, I suppose, huh? You don't really keep up to date with entertainment news at all? Uh, yeah, now and then. <laughs> all right, well, I tell you what, thanks, uh, thanks for letting me uh, do this interview with you. And uh, I think we're. I think we got all that we need. I think. <laughs> good. All right. Good, good, talk, good talking with you. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you uh, on Facebook. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, and, and, and Facebook me your um, URL to where I can hear this interview. Yes, I, I will do that. Uh, it probably won't uh, air until later in the month because I have a few other interviews that I have sure. to air first, but I will definitely let you know. Okay, yeah, thanks. All right, thanks, man. Bye. Bye. And that was Michael C. Gross. And, and just uh, so you know that this is not Michael Gross from uh, 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 from Family Ties, as some people might have thought. No, it's uh, Michael C. Gross, who, uh, uh, as you just heard, uh, was part of Natural Lampoon's magazine and also helped on uh, Ghostbusters 1 and 2, as well as Dave, uh, Kindergarten Cop, Beethoven's 1 and 2, Beethoven's uh, 1, Beethoven's 2, and, and of course... Uh, you know, other movies like Heavy Metal and stuff. Uh, that was his first film. And I'm going to go check out Heavy Metal. And maybe I'll do a review on Heavy Metal later on uh, uh, when I've uh, had a chance to check it out. But, uh, yeah, I, that's one movie I guess I've I've heard about and I think I've seen the trailer for. But I've never seen it. I didn't really know what it was about. But uh, at one time I thought it was like all about porn and everything. But I guess, uh, no, it's not just about that. So, anyway, uh, I want to take... Uh, Michael for being a part of this interview. Sorry about my voice. Uh, uh, normally I don't do interviews like this when my voice is uh, out of whack. Uh, I just uh, was getting over getting over a cold. And at the part uh, where this is uh, being recorded, this is uh, uh, the date is June 24th, 2013. But you'll hear this uh, some point in July when I get uh, when, when it's when it's turned to uh, uh, air right after the uh, interview I did with. Uh, Larry Holly here a while back, uh, Buddy Holly's older brother. So uh, we're still doing interviews with uh, icons of pop culture. There's a lot of people that I want to talk to. Uh, this summer is going to be great. And I was thinking about possibly extend- extending this to September uh, because there's going to be some changes coming my way that I will eventually mention about here eventually. Uh, either by now you know about it or you don't know about it yet. But uh, I will be going through some changes here uh, in my life uh, pretty soon, uh, location-wise. So uh, we'll just keep uh, I'll just keep you posted, and uh, hopefully I'll get my bo- my voice back here soon. So uh, anyway, it's Frank Sasson, and uh, thanks again for tuning in to another great edition of Frankie's Icons of Pop Culture with uh, today's guest Michael C. Gross. Thank you very much. Bye bye. <laughs>